I assure you, I will not be going for a long time tonight. Um, I'm only trying to shake hands with people I don't like. <laughs> and, and then I ran into Bill Barry. He's the one that I connected with, that uh, his rusty asses do. And I took my hand out, so so I quickly had to remedy that. I'm carrying my own sanitizer in here, so I had him sanitize his hands. So if he gets sick, it wasn't from me. Um, I want to tell you how I met Randy. When I moved to the Pentagon in, uh, in the year 1998, it was only a, a week after Rocky had, did, had uh, what do you call it, when they open up the new building, the new sanctuary, dedicated, dedicated the new sanctuary. And we left the next a day or two after that. We moved to, uh, to D.C. And it was a very sad time for us because we were leaving our, our, mostly because we were leaving our church family. Our kids were, were uh, my daughter was going to school up at uh, Birmingham. My son moved in with Ron Moore. So we were without kids at that point. So we were going up with two dogs and a cat. And we weren't happy at all about getting assigned to the Pentagon. In fact, it was we, we cried every night on our way up there. We spent a couple nights at hotels and stuff. So we got up there, and I lived about 25 miles south of the Pentagon. So I had learned, I had been told by people who had been at the Pentagon that slugging is the way to get to the Pentagon. Now, who here has slugged? Okay, so I'll let, I'll let you decide whether slug means something that comes out of a shotgun or something that is a crawly little slimy thing. <laughs> but that's the way to get to the Pentagon because they have high occupancy vehicle lanes up in that part of the country and you have to have so many people in a car. Well, where I lived, you had to have three people in the car. So you would actually go out and stand in line in what they called the <coughs> slug line. And you would wait for cars to come and pick you up. The rule was is you did not talk to the driver unless the driver first talked to you. So my, my first week going up to the Pentagon, I slugged into work. And I thought, this is, this is really a neat way to get to work. Didn't cost me a dime. It was somebody else's gas, somebody else's vehicle. Some of the vehicles were nice. One guy had a great Oldsmobile, I loved it. But one guy picked me up one morning, his name was Dick Morton. And we were driving in, and he talked to me, so that made it okay for me to talk to him. And he told me that uh, he was with the Christian Embassy. Well, I had just come from Saudi Arabia, and, and I was, I didn't know there was such an embassy as a Christian Embassy. So Dick explained to me what it was, and he said, you should come to the Pentagon on Wednesday mornings to the executive dining room, and we have a man who comes in and teaches us every Wednesday morning at 7 o'clock. So my office was not, that, that Pentagon was undergoing renovation at the time, my office was over in Roslyn, so he said, uh, oh, he said, I'll, I'll take you over to Roslyn because it goes right by where I work. So I talked with him even longer. So I started learning about what camp, what the, uh, Christian Embassy was and what Campus Crusade, how it was tied to that and what they did for going out and evangelizing to these foreign uh, people in the foreign embassies, which I thought that is really a neat outreach. I don't think, I don't know that they reached out to the Saudi Arabian Embassy, but maybe they did, I don't know. So I thought, well, you know something? I'm probably never going to get to the executive dining room at the Pentagon unless I go to this Wednesday morning class. So I was curious what the Wednesday morning, or what the executive dining room was like. So I decided, okay, I'm gonna go over there, eat breakfast with them, and, and get a lesson, and I get to eat in the executive dining room. That wasn't near the treat, because that's where I met Randy. And from then on, any Wednesday I was in town, I did not miss that 7 a.m. In fact, I had it on my schedule so people could look at my schedule and they'd know I was not in the office until 8 that morning. So, I'm going to tell some more. But I forgot what else I was going to say. <laughs> so, Randy would, Randy would come in and he would speak. We would eat breakfast for the first 15 minutes or so, and then he would stand up and start speaking to us for anywhere from 20 to 30 minutes. And it was usually, I didn't, uh, 
I was not ready for him to end. But I would go home and I would tell my wife, I had a wow. What he said, I said, wow. And I'd say it right out loud in the, in the breakfast. And, and that was not unusual for people to say that. So as we, as we, as time went on, I got to know Randy more and decided that's the guy I want to link up with. So we've, we've stayed in contact with each other for the 17 years since we first met. And I'm uh, really glad that we have been. I'm glad that, Randy, I'm really glad that you came down here to be part of our, our men's retreat tonight. I really look forward to this. I think he's going to wow you over the next uh, three days. We have tonight, two sessions tomorrow, and then he's preaching at the church on Sunday morning. So I think you're going to enjoy all that. Uh, Randy has written three books, and he's in the, in the process of writing the fourth book. So it's in your, in your uh, handout what those books are. Many of you in this room have read those books. At least I gave you copies of them, so I hope you read them. <laughs> uh -huh. so, it, uh, but others, I know that we just went through the, the Bringing the Gospel Home uh, men's group at 5.30 on Tuesday mornings. have been going through that for the last uh, however many chapters there are in the book. That's how many weeks we've been doing it. So, uh, so many people here are familiar with your stories, but Randy, we want you to, if they're in the books, we want you to repeat the stories anyway. Um, now, there's one other thing that I would like to... Uh, let you know, Randy likes Starbucks coffee. <laughs> so, if he was to get out the pulpit on Sunday morning and found some Starbucks gift cards on the pulpit, I think he would be very happy. <laughs> Is that true? Yes. That <laughs> was an affirmative. Okay, Randy, it's over to you. Wow us. <laughs> Is that a surprise? Okay. Well, it is great to be with you, and um, golly, the pressure's on. Now I have to wow you. I don't know. I almost have this terrible fear that people will be saying, wow, Dan has no discernment. Uh, we'll see. We'll see. No, I really am delighted to be with you, and, I'm, and I've been looking forward to this for quite a while. And. Um, um, I'm very excited about uh, talking about evangelism. That's uh, the theme of this weekend conference is evangelism for non-evangelists. Um, when I first set up this uh, series, I did not know that I'd be preaching on Sunday, so that was a, a bonus. So if you will, think of this as a four-part series. Tonight's part one, tomorrow will be two and three, and then Sunday morning is the fourth one. And I want us to try to think how can people who are not naturally gifted as evangelists do the work of an evangelist. Now, maybe I'm making an assumption, but um, I'm, I, I should probably find out how many of you would say that your primary spiritual gift and your number one calling in life is as an evangelist. How many evangelists do we have? Yeah, that's what I usually get in a room this size. So one, we're uh, grateful that you're here. The rest of us, Oh, we're evangelistic chickens, aren't we? Um, I worked with an evangelistic organization for 34 years, Campus Crusade for Christ. Even the name sounds, ooh, yeah, crusade. And I always felt guilty because I was never like those guys up front. The people who would get up and speak, they, they would just talk about how easy it was, how natural it was, how every day it was. And I thought, not for me. And, and I remember one time one of the speakers said, I cannot sleep at night unless I have witnessed to one soul that day. And I remember thinking, I'm sleeping just fine, buddy. I don't know. <laughs> so um, I, I remember also one, uh, one person was talking about how he always witnessed on airplanes. And in fact, I think every speaker that we had at a staff conference always witnessed on airplanes. It's, I don't know, it's, it's high up, close to heaven. It's apparently where all evangelism takes place. And, and I, just always, I just felt so guilty. Every speaker would, you know, and, and the people they sat next to were always interested always ready and I thought they must fly different planes on different planets than I do I don't know I remember one guy said every time I get up every 
I'm a little worried about that word every. Every time I get on a plane, I always pray for the person who sits next to me. And I just felt so guilty because I thought I pray for an empty seat. <laughs> um, so I have been wrestling for 30 plus years. How do evangelistic chickens do evangelism? Or how do non-evangelists -evangelists do evangelism? Or what did Paul have in mind when he told Timothy a shy, timid man to do the work of an evangelist. And so I, I try to um, think, how can people without that gift work this in so that the people that God has sovereignly placed in their lives will start to think about things they never think about, will start to wrestle with issues that they need to wrestle with, but they haven't. So I, what I want to do tonight is say that it seems to me the first thing, the most important thing for all of us to do, if we are ever to do the work of an evangelist, is that we must drink deeply from the well of the gospel. We must dig down roots so that the gospel, the message that God has saved us, sent his son to save us, to die a death, for us, for atoning for our sins, that that so fills us and enamors us that it's, it's the grid then that we see everything. Uh, tomorrow morning I want to talk about how we might actually preach the gospel to ourselves first. And then in the second talk we'll talk some practicalities. How do we actually bring up the topic? How do we make it a two-way conversation? And then Sunday morning, Lord willing, I hope to kind of tie it all together with um, four tensions that we all live with as we live out this life in this world. So that's, that's where we're going. Um, but let, me, let me set uh, the, the stage a little bit more. Uh, what I'm trying to say is uh, the vast majority of Christians um, find evangelism to be a challenge. And so what, what I want to say is um, let's figure out how we do it even if it always will be a challenge. For the first 10 years that I was on staff with Campus Crusade for Christ, I kept thinking at some point, this is gonna become easy for me. At some point, this is gonna be for me the way it was for Bill Bright, the founder and president of Campus Crusade. And then one day, probably about 10 years in, I thought, wait a minute, what if it's never easy? Can God still use me anyway? What if I'm always uncomfortable? And then this really horrible thought, what if I'm making comfort my God? What if comfort and ease and naturalness is more important to me than the glory of God? And I had to repent of that. And I have seen God use me now when I'm afraid, when I'm uncomfortable. And I, and I wrestle in my mind of, Lord, would you help me so that your name and your truth at this very moment would be more important to, to me than my comfort and ease. And it's an internal struggle. Here, let me make it worse. Um, <laughs> um, well, let me, uh, uh, I'm going to get around to this. I'm originally from New York, and I'm from a Jewish background. If you're from New York, and you're from a Jewish background, we tend to see things kind of um, negatively. <laughs> If you know our history, can you blame us? So, um, so you may need to translate almost everything that I say to, to, to Florida Gentile. Um, so, if, so if at some point during this year, he seems rather negative, just, oh Lord, work in him anyway. Okay, so, um, so here, so I'm, I've, I've, I've started off by saying, wow, this is difficult and most of us are not evangelists. Wait, it gets worse. Our world has shifted dramatically away from the gospel. When Campus Crusade was started and when a whole bunch of different evangelistic organizations started and started figuring out how do we reach out to people in the 1950s and 1960s, the vast majority of people in our country already kind of knew what we believe. They just needed to be kind of nudged. Can I, that's Yiddish. Is that okay? Do you, uh, do you, we know, get it. you know nudge? You know? Yeah, every so often I may need to translate. Sorry. Uh, so um, they need to just be pushed. They need to be invited. They need to be. Uh, they need to hear a, a a call. But our world today is dramatically different. People don't know what we believe. They think they do, but they're way off. 
and they really think that what we believe is really pretty bizarre, right? Or worse than bizarre, they, they think it's bad. They buy by best sellers of books that say that religion is bad. So um, when my so here's how I like to illustrate it. When you're going to talk to the people who are your next door neighbors or the coworkers in the building that you work in or on the sideline of the soccer field that you're cheering for the same uh, kid that's uh, their kid, um, uh, your kid and their kid are playing on the same team. That's what I meant to say. Um, um, you're in a world where they think your whole worldview is kind of strange. When my oldest son was in high school, he came home and he, he came up with a theory about how the whole world works, which is kind of the way Dan thinks, uh, my son. Uh, he, he understands everything in the whole wide world. And uh, his theory, I think, um, has some uh, comparableness to our world today when it comes to spiritual things. Dan's theory, he called the plug theory. If you read Questioning Evangelism, you read about it in chapter 3. Dan said, the plug theory explains how everything works in our world. It explains world history. It explains military strategy. It explains geography. If you understand the plug theory, you'll never look at a world map quite the same way again. You ready? Here's the plug theory. Every country has, somewhere near its geographic center, a big plug holding it up. And if somebody somehow pulled it, the country would sink. You're all looking way too seriously right now. This is a joke. Ha 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 ha. Okay, let's pray. Uh, no, um, um, Dan was quite serious. No, he wasn't. But he would, he would tell us where all of the different plugs were in the, in the world. He would come to the world map. Um, he believes that our plug, uh, America's plug, is somewhere in the middle of Kansas. Um, probably within the confines of the military base there at Fort Leavenworth. Because it's so close um, to uh, the penitentiary, Leavenworth Penitentiary, and so you had to protect it, which is why the security at Leavenworth is so extreme and strong. And so every time we drove through Kansas, Dan was always looking out the window to see if he could see the plug. Um, uh, Dan believes uh, that the plug, uh, the, the country that has the most secure plug in all the world is Switzerland, because it's high up in the Swiss Alps, probably under 10 feet of ice, and so that's why Switzerland has been neutral in so many wars because no one's going to pull their plug. Um, uh, the lost colony of Atlantis didn't guard its plug very well. And so you see how this goes. All right, why am I telling this? Because there are a whole lot of people in the world today who are about as likely to believe the gospel as they are to believe the plug theory. It's absurd. It's ridiculous. It doesn't fit with their worldview. And so the, the stuff we just sang about that moves our souls, that we, make, we raise our hands about how God died for sinners and his blood atones for our rebellion, these are words that make us just excited. But for many people in the world, that's just like a plug in the middle of Kansas holding us up. So how do we reach this world with this wonderful news? Um, so what I want to do is think about how do we dig down into this gospel so that we start thinking about it in a much fuller, richer way and think about it in a way that it starts shaping the way we see everything. Now maybe I should back up a little bit and tell you about my story, about how I came to faith. I told you I'm from New York and I'm from, Jew I'm from a Jewish background. And you're thinking, most Jewish people I know do not believe in Jesus. And believe me, my relatives have been telling me that for a long time, yes. <laughs> so why don't I tell you a little bit about my story, about how I came to this uh, place. Um, and then uh, I want to dig into a particular passage in the Old Testament where we see the gospel in richness and in fullness. Um, uh, I, uh, my, my parents uh, were, are both Jewish. My parents... Um, uh, my dad fought in World War II. My parents were of the Jewish generation that first learned of the horrors of the Holocaust. My dad fought in World War II and then found out toward the end of that of what was going on all over Europe. And so um, when you were being raised as a young Jewish boy in the 1950s and 1960s, you were raised, I was raised in a world that said never again. Never again will we allow these horrible, evil people to try to wipe us off the face of the earth. 
And so even though my parents were not very religious in their Judaism, they were very strongly culturally um, identified with their Jewishness. And so in addition to going to public school, three afternoons a week I also went to Hebrew school. So I would learn Hebrew, I would learn the rituals of Judaism so that I could have my bar mitzvah when I was 13 and then I could participate in Jewish worship. Even though my parents weren't really all that observant and didn't go to synagogue all that much. But that was pretty standard back then. And so I started taking Judaism, I think, more seriously than my parents and then my extended family. I think God was working in me and drawing me to himself so that I really wanted to get to know this God. But no matter how hard I tried, God seemed distant and alien, and I, I just didn't seem to, to able to connect with him at all. Um, I had my bar mitzvah when I was 13, and I learned all of the prayers, and I learned all of the rituals, and I thought once I had kind of passed that threshold that God was then going to be as real to me as I thought he was supposed to be, but it didn't work. Two years later, on Yom Kippur, the Day of Atonement, the, the holiest day of the year, I said, okay, on this, this time, this Yom Kippur, I'm going to do everything you're supposed to do so that finally I can get to know God. On Yom Kippur, you don't eat, it's a day of fasting, you don't do any kind of work, in fact, you don't even, you don't have any kind of comforts. You don't drive in a car, so I walked to synagogue, our synagogue was about two miles away from our home. Um, I, I did everything you're supposed to do, and in, in, on Yom Kippur, you actually go to synagogue the evening before the holiday, and then the whole next day. So I walked to uh, synagogue, and then walked home that evening, walked back the next morning, I was there all that time. And a big part of Yom Kippur ritual, liturgy, is confession of sin. So you, you're given a whole big long list of all of the sins that you could possibly can commit, and I confessed them all. Now the list was in Hebrew, so I really didn't know what I was saying, but I thought just in case, I better confess it, and even, I don't know what it means, but even so, maybe it'll work. And, and I really was hoping that by the end of this holiday, God would be real and near to me, and it would all make sense, and it didn't work. I walked home at the end of the holiday. I remember seeing the sun setting, and I was thinking, what did I, what did I miss? What did I do wrong? What didn't, what didn't I get right? I was dressed up in a suit. You get dressed up on Yom Kippur. I was walking along, and I uh, was wearing dress shoes, nice, fine leather shoes. And as I'm walking, I'm looking, I'm staring down at my shoes, and I remembered from years before in Hebrew school, I had learned that on Yom Kippur, you're not supposed to wear leather shoes. Now, that's not in the scriptures, it's not in the Bible, but it's the rabbi's tradition. It was too much like work or something, wearing leather shoes. And so if you were to somehow go to a synagogue today on, on Yom Kippur, you would see all of the men dressed in suits and wearing athletic shoes. And so as I'm walking, looking at my dress shoes, I went, oh, that's what I did wrong. I wore the wrong shoes. Maybe next year. And then I thought, that's the stupidest thing in the world. you got to be kidding me. <laughs> that's what it means to know God? This is the kind of stuff that God says is important? Do this, don't do this, do this, eat this, don't eat this, wear the right shoes? I thought, that is crazy. If that's the kind of stuff that this God is into, I don't think I want to get to know. And I don't think I remember, I don't think I actually prayed a conscious prayer, but I think it had that effect of a, 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 a cry out to God, there must be some other way. There's got to be some other way to get to know you other than remembering all 600 plus rules plus all the things the rabbis add on top of that. Um, and so uh, it, was, it was a very big disappointment. Now a couple of years later, this friend of mine invited me to his church youth group. Now, if you're Jewish, you don't do any of that church stuff because church, that's where those... Christians are, and Christians were the ones who persecuted us. For the, for the vast majority of Jewish people, there's not really Jews and Gentiles, and then some of those Gentiles are Christians. For most Jewish people, there's us Jews, and everybody else are Christians. So you, at your church, and the people at the Catholic Church, and the guy who stands outside preaching, yelling, and screaming, and Martin Luther, and Adolf Hitler, and who knows how many other people, they're all Christians. 
So you can see why Jewish people are not too keen about learning about this particular religion that you have. And this friend invited me to his church youth group, but I thought, well, no, we don't really do that. But then he said, it's really fun, and the girls are cute. So I went. And he was right, praise the Lord. And, um, and so it was a lot of fun, and the girls were cute, and we did lots of fun stuff because it was a youth group, and we went to the beach, and we went to the roller skating rink, and we did all sorts of fun stuff. But I met this whole group of people who talked about knowing God in a personal way. They talked about having a personal relationship with God. They talked to God all the time. They prayed like it was just breathing. They prayed in their own work. They prayed in English. I thought that was an unfair advantage. <laughs> I thought God only knew Hebrew. <laughs> and I, w I was just attracted to this. And so I, I would ask questions about this. How do you know this God? And it was always the same answer they gave. Jesus. And I always said, well, we don't do that Jesus stuff. I'm Jewish. We don't do that. And, and by the way, that had always been the, the conversation ender with every other Christian that I had ever talked to. If they were talking about Jesus and I said, oh, I'm Jewish. We don't believe in Jesus. They changed the subject. That was the end of the conversation. This group of Christians, however, would say, so, well, you know, Jesus was Jewish. I said, well, yeah, of course, everybody knows that. And then they said, well, you know, his followers were Jewish. Yeah, I kind of knew that. The New Testament, for the most part, was written by Jewish people. Oh, I didn't know that. And, and you know, the, the guys who wrote the New Testament thought it just fit perfectly with the Old Testament. Hmm. And, and they, they planted ideas in my head. This is senior year of high school. And, I, and, and they challenged me to read the New Testament. In fact, they gave me a copy, a paperback New Testament. It was when the NIV translation had just come out. It said on the cover, The Great News. <laughs> and I didn't read it. Uh, we're, we're just kind of uncomfortable having something that says New Testament. Hmm. But I took it away with me to college anyway. Now, I went away to college, and I kind of forgot all about that kind of stuff. Uh, on, on the books, it said I was a music major, but in reality, my major was beer. Uh, the first year and a half, apologies to those of you who brought your young sons, uh, we'll talk later. Uh, uh, it's the truth. I, I, um, I, I got really into a whole lot of very absurd philosophy. I took a philosophy class and learned about existentialism, life is pointless and meaningless. That fit very well with getting drunk. I watched a lot of Woody Allen movies that reinforced it. I read a lot of Kurt Vonnegut novels that reinforced it even more. And I thought life was just pointless and meaningless, so let's just have fun. Somewhere in the midst of that, though, I, I, there was this nagging thought of, no, there's got to be some meaning. There's got to be something that pulls it together. There's got to be something that isn't absurd. And I thought it was music. I majored in music. I lived. I was going to college in, at Temple University in Philadelphia. I took the subway every Saturday night to downtown Philadelphia to listen to the Philadelphia Orchestra. I sat there listening to the music, and I thought, maybe someday I'm going to hear a piece of music that will be it. It'll be this transcendent experience. It'll be this thing that I'm really looking for. And, and, it, and it almost did it. There were times when I would be listening to a piece of music, and I thought, this is it, finally. This is the piece I've been looking for. This is the experience. But then the piece would end. And then there was this emptiness again. And I would leave the Philadelphia Academy of Music, and I'd have to get back on the subway. And if ever there's a crashing uh, blow of reality, it's the Philadelphia subway. Anybody from Philadelphia? Did I just offend anybody? Uh, okay, good, yeah. So every Saturday night, I get, okay, maybe this is going to be it, but then you'd walk back out on the street, no, 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 and it was always this disappointment. And then in the middle of my sophomore year, a guy who lived down the end of the hallway died in this tragic, horrible accident. I'll spare you the details, because it was pretty gruesome, but I remember sitting at his funeral a few days later, and I thought, okay, i got to get some answers, because... Woody Allen, Kurt Vonnegut, and Heineken are not helping me very much. And so I decided to read the New Testament. And it reminded me a lot of the Old Testament. 
I had been told by my rabbi and, and the Jewish world that the New Testament is a very anti-Semitic book. That it was an alien, foreign, different religion, really weird. And uh, basically, Jesus was a good guy who said some nice stuff about loving people. That's about it. He's a good rabbi. Um, but but it's just, it's, it's a bad book. It was used by people for anti-Semitic purposes. But that wasn't my experience. I read it. I, I remember the fact that on the cover it said the great news, and I remember thinking this really is great, and it really is news. It was wonderful. Uh, Jesus was the best teacher I'd ever read about. Jesus said the most amazing things. I, I, I was uh, so attracted to him. He was the best rabbi, the most, the most um, inspiring thinker, and he was remarkably Jewish. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John sounded a whole lot to me like Isaiah, Jeremiah, Micah, Habakkuk. I didn't think of them as two different books. I thought these two really fit together. I remember marveling at one point thinking, why is it that Christians don't know about this book, this Old Testament? Why is it that Jewish people don't know about this book, this New Testament? Why is it still to this day that when I speak in churches and I talk about Passover or the, uh, the prophets, that the vast majority of Christian people that I meet don't really know that part of their Bible, even though it's 70% of it? And why is it that Jewish people think that, that Christianity is so very different? Because for me, they fit together. Um, and so uh, it was all kind of an intellectual thing at first, where I became more and more convinced that Jesus really was the Messiah, the one predicted by Isaiah and Micah and all those guys. I was struck by the fact that at the very beginning of the Gospel of Matthew, that was the one people told me to read first because it was written by a Jewish man to a Jewish audience, where he talked about fulfillment of prophecy. And I would read it in my paperback, uh, Good, Great News, and then I would turn to my hardback Tanakh, the Hebrew Scriptures that I was given um, for my Bar Mitzvah, and I would read it, and I would look at these two things and see how they fit together. And then I read C.S. Lewis's book, Mere Christianity, and uh, Lewis helped me not just understand that Jesus was the Messiah, but that he couldn't be anything else. I had been told Jesus said some nice things about love your enemies, but, you know, he wasn't God. He wasn't the Messiah. I mean, you know, that's, that's what people uh, attributed to him hundreds of years later. But then I came to this part of where Lewis says in Mere Christianity... I'm trying here to prevent anyone from saying the really foolish thing that people often say about him. I'm ready to accept Jesus as a great moral teacher, but I don't accept his claim to be God. That is the one thing we must not say. A man who was merely a man and said the sort of things Jesus said would not be a great moral teacher. He would either be a lunatic on the level of a person who calls himself a poached egg, or else he would be the devil of hell. You must make your choice. Either this man was and is the son of God, or else a madman or something worse. You can shut him up for a fool, you can spit at him and kill him as a demon, or you can fall at his feet and call him Lord and God. But let us not come up with any patronizing nonsense about his being a great human teacher. He has not left that open to us, he did not intend to. And so in the middle of my sophomore year in the high-rise dorm of uh, Johnson Hall at Temple University, I prayed and said, God, thank you that life isn't absurd. It is found in knowing you, the one who sent Jesus to die for my sins. And then I kept reading C.S. Lewis because I was so attracted to, the, to hear about his story, about he also longed for some kind of transcendent thing. For him it was in music, but mostly in literature, in mythology, and yet those were also disappointing. And I came across this quote of Lewis, where he talked about finding what all of those books and music pointed to. He said this, and I promise, this will be my last C.S. Lewis quote. Some of you are, okay, I know. I now work for the C.S. Lewis Institute, and so I have to quote him. It's part of the contract, just kidding. Lewis said this, the books or the music in which we thought the beauty was located will betray us if we trust to them. It was not in them. It only came through them. And what came through them was longing. 
These things, the beauty, the memory of our own past, are good images of what we really desire. But if they are mistaken for the thing itself, they turn into dumb idols, breaking the hearts of their worshipers. That's what I experienced every Saturday night at the Academy of Music. My heart was broken because I was worshiping something that could not fulfill. Lewis says, they are not the thing itself. They are only the scent of a flower we have not found, the echo of a tune we have not heard, news from a country we have never yet visited. And so in, in sophomore year, at age 20, I saw Old and New Testament fitting together. I saw my Jewishness fulfilled in the Jewish Messiah. I saw my love of music fit into the right place. I still love music. It's a wonderful gift. It's just not a very good God. That is true of everything else other than God, by the way. That is a gift from God. Not everything. Okay, there's some things that are sin, but there are so many things that God gives us that are wonderful gifts. And if you can appreciate them as secondary things, you can enjoy them. Music, art, good food, your, your family, marriage, sex. There, there's so many things that God gives us as gifts. And if we remember that that's not what we should worship as ultimate, we can enjoy it. We need to remember to keep second things second. So what I'm hoping for this weekend is that you will feel a deeper and deeper connection to this good news so that it really will be good. So that when, and we will talk about evangelism, but when you do talk to non-Christians, they won't just get this sense that, oh, you really believe that this is true. Yes, it is true. But they also get a sense you really like this. It's not just true, but it's really good. What is it that you have? So, now I'm ready to pray. Are you ready to pray? But not as a closing prayer. Somebody say, I'm, I, he's ready to be done, right? No, no, no. This is just the beginning. I have till 10 p.m. according to the schedule. Did you see that on the schedule? Don't worry, it won't go that long. But let me give you a moment to pray and ask God to work in your heart this weekend, tonight, tomorrow, and Sunday, so that your uh, appreciation of the gospel grows, your desire to share it grows, your heart and your compassion for people who don't know it will grow as well. Let's pray. Our Father and our God, thank you for the people that you bring into our lives who don't know you. It's no accident that they work in the same office with us or they live on the same street with us. Would you work in their hearts to draw them to yourself? Would you work in our hearts so that we would want to tell them of the great news of Jesus? Would you use this weekend toward that end? We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Uh, when I had my bar mitzvah when I was 13, I read from a passage in the prophet Isaiah. I thought it would be a good idea to get to know what Isaiah was all about, so I read the whole book. But, I, but when I got up on that Saturday morning, I only recited a few verses. But Isaiah became the prophet that I kind of got to know more than the others. And um, I remember being struck by this passage in Isaiah chapter 53 about a servant. And every time I read it, I thought, sure sounds like Jesus. Um, but then I would read what Jewish rabbis would say, and no, 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 it's certainly not about Jesus. And the more they tried to argue that it wasn't about Jesus, the more I kept thinking, oh, it sure sounds like him. <clears throat> they, would, they would point out the fact that Isaiah talked about the servant many times. He's first mentioned in chapter 42, then he's mentioned again in chapter 44 and 45 and 47 and 49. And on several of those occasions... Isaiah says that the servant is Israel, people of Israel, but not always. Sometimes it's not identified as Israel. And in one case, the anointed one that is kind of connected to this title servant is actually Cyrus, the Persian king who allowed uh, the Jewish people to come back into the land. So it's very confusing who this servant is. 
So is it Israel? Is it somebody else? Is it Cyrus? But you know, Isaiah did that a bunch of times in his book. He would, he would use a mysterious term, but not tell you who it is until several chapters later. Very early in the book of Isaiah, he talks about a branch. Branch. Who's this? It's just kind of this mysterious person who's known as a branch. And then later on, we find out this is God. And so Isaiah did this. He would, he would introduce a, a, a character or an event or a, a person. And, and sometimes the person um, did something. But then, but then you would talk about the person again. And you think, wait a minute. This description doesn't fit this person. Earlier in chapter uh, 7, there's this whole big, very difficult complex thing about uh, King Ahaz, and I'm sorry I won't get into that, but it's very complex and confusing. So there's a great deal of debate within Jewish circles as to who the servant is in chapter 53. Um, the probably, I mean, for a very long time, the prevailing view is it is the Messiah, but then around 1100 or so, a rabbi came along, and there was tremendous persecution against the Jewish people, and this rabbi said, no, and that's, that's, that's giving the Christians some ammunition. And so um, he came up with the idea, this was a rabbi who was known as Rashi, and he said that the, the Messiah is Israel. And that became the prevailing view, still even to this day. But the problem is, when you read about this servant, and this, the description begins in verse 13 of chapter 52, and goes all the way to the end of chapter 53, toward the end, Describing this servant, in verse 9 he says, Though he had done no violence, nor was there any deceit in his mouth. Now could Isaiah actually say that about Israel? Israel had done no violence, nor was there any deceit in his mouth. This is Isaiah the prophet, who early on when he's commissioned in chapter 6, he says, Woe is me, I'm undone, I'm a man of unclean lips, and I live among a people of unclean lips. And then for the next 40 chapters, he rails against Israel about all of the deceit that's going on in their mouths and in their lives, and all of the sin, and all of the deception, and all of the terrible things that are coming out of their mouths. So I don't, that, it seems to me that's the one identity of the servant that we could cross off the list most emphatically. And so, I think there are enough rabbis who have said, no, this is definitely the Messiah. And if Cyrus was a servant, he was only a foreshadow of pointing to a servant who would be a, 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 a king who leads people into a new land, but in a much greater way. And if this servant was once identified with Israel, a sufferer, how much more will it point to a greater sufferer who will suffer in a much greater way? So this passage that begins in verse 13 of chapter 52 through the end of chapter 53 builds and builds and builds and talks about a servant who doesn't just suffer, but suffers in a way that makes atonement for others. Now I'm not going to read the whole passage, but I would invite you to read it and to memorize it and to dig into it and enjoy it and see all of the things that God portrayed, foreshadowed, prophesied about a suffering servant. I do want to zero in on verses 4 through 6. So let me read this and then just point out a few things. Surely this servant, he, took up our infirmities <coughs> excuse me, and carried our sorrows. Yet we considered him stricken by God, smitten by him and afflicted. He was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was upon him, and by his wounds we are healed. All of us, like sheep, have gone astray. Each of us has turned to his own way. But the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. It's an amazing paragraph. It is, it is different than so many other places in Scripture, but it's not totally unique. There are other places that talk about one who suffers and atones. You know, um, if I can step back from this a little bit, a lot of times Christians are baffled. Why is it that Jewish people don't accept Jesus as the Messiah? Well, I think the most common reason, and I think there's, there's a, a valid basis to this, the vast majority 
of um, messianic prophecies talk about the Messiah being a reigning king, mm -hmm. a conquering, victorious king, a military hero. I shouldn't have said vast majority, but certainly more than half. Uh, someone has once uh, mapped out, they believe there are about 800 prophecies that are about the Messiah, and 500 of them are about this reigning king, this conquering king, this victorious one who defeats the enemies. And it's less than half that talk about one who suffers, one who is pierced, one who dies, one who is crushed. So I think the reason that Jewish people tend to think Jesus wasn't the Messiah because he wasn't that conquering king. Do we still have evil and suffering in the world? Do we still have oppression? Is there still problems? Is there peace yet? Does the lion lay down with the lamb? No, not yet. And in fact, some rabbis wrestled with, how do we make sense of this? We've got 300 prophecies about a sufferer, and we have 500 prophecies about a king. Maybe there are two messiahs. And that's a theory that actually caught on and has been written about by some rabbis uh, for quite a long time. They talk about the Messiah, son of David, and the Messiah, son of Joseph. The Messiah, son of David, is the conquering king. And then the Messiah, son of Joseph, like Joseph in Genesis, who suffered at the hands of his brothers, would be a suffering Messiah. Two different Messiahs. That's the only way they can make sense of these prophecies. The problem is we have a few places where it's talked about as one person does both. I think if we were to study this larger context, you'd see that this one who suffers later on is one who um, overcomes death. Um, it says, he will, uh, after, uh, he will see his offspring and prolong his days. After the suffering of his soul, he will see the light of life. So somehow this one is both a sufferer and a conqueror. Zechariah also has pictures about one coming back who will reign, and he is the one, they will look on the one whom they have pierced. One very, very prominent uh, rabbi, Martin Buber, was once asked, when the Messiah comes, what should be the first question we should ask him? You know what he said? He said, I would ask the Messiah, have you ever been here before? <laughs> but so we Christians would say, the people who are saying, well, there must be two Messiahs, that's actually close. <laughs> that's better than only looking for the Messiah who fulfills 500 prophecies and ignores those other 300. We would say, no, not two messiahs. There's one messiah, but he comes twice. And he comes once to fulfill all of those suffering servant prophecies, and then he will come again to fulfill those conquering king, son of David prophecies. So let's dig into this one. I want you to see three things in these verses. The first is I want you to see the severity of the problem that the servant solves. It's a really bad problem. It starts out sounding not so bad, infirmities and sorrows. Well, you know, we all have infirmities, we all have sorrows. But it gets worse. It then becomes transgressions, iniquities. Um, iniquities are mentioned several times. It's, um, it's uh, something that requires punishment. It's rebellion against God. These words, transgressions, iniquities... A few chapters later, this prophet, Isaiah, says, Surely the arm of the Lord is not too short to save, nor is his ear too dull to hear. But your iniquities, same word, have separated you from your God. Your sins have hidden his face from you, so that he will not hear. Hidden his face. That, that should, that should um, cause horror in our, us. <laughs> The, the most beautiful, most wonderful blessing that you could ever say was Aaron's benediction from the book of Numbers. May the Lord make his face shine on you. Here it says that your iniquities have turned his face away from you so they cannot even hear you. The problem is really a horrible problem. Now, I'll say more about this tomorrow morning, but I, 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 I'll, I'll tell you, all of us tend to underestimate how bad our sin is. But we need to see it in, in terms of biblical uh, description. It causes alienation from God. It causes him to turn his face away from us. It, it causes him to say, I can't even hear you. Now, obviously, you know, there's nothing too difficult for God. It's not like he suddenly goes deaf. 
not like his hearing is impaired. But your sin is so offensive that God says, I won't even listen. So that's how bad the problem is. It's infirmities, it's transgressions, it's iniquities, it's alienation, it's separation from God. It caused the man and the woman in the garden to hide. And it has caused every single person who has ever lived to hide in some way in shame and alienation from the God who created them for intimacy and, purpose, and, and knowing him personally. Secondly, I want you to see the universality of the problem. All. We all. In verse 6, in the Hebrew text, um, the very first word in the text is all, and then the very last word at the end of the verse is all. That's a Hebrew device of putting the same word at the beginning and the end to say, this is really the big idea. I hope you're paying attention. All we like sheep have gone astray. All of us have this problem. I, I'm, I'm just assuming, you know, um, uh, when, when we're compared to sheep in the Bible, it's not a good thing, right? You know this? They're stupid. They fall off cliffs. They don't eat food because they can't seem to find it. They're helpless. Yeah, you got it. So, I mean, all we like sheep, you know, I, I, I don't know. In some circles, that's, oh, that's nice, sheep. No, it's not nice at all. This is, uh, Isaiah is ranting and raving at this point. It is, it's, it's, um, and it, all of us have this problem. Um, um, my, my two younger sons say that um, I, I only tell stories about um, my oldest son, and they feel like I leave them out. Um, uh, so um, if you're ever in touch with any of my sons, say, yeah, that's why your dad is. Um, so uh, my oldest son, the inventor of the plug theory, um, he also has, I think, the most graphic <laughs> illustrations about sin. So that's why I use them so much. Um, when Dan was a little boy, we lived on this street that uh, it was a very short street, and uh, we had a sidewalk in front of the house, and the street went around a turn uh, as you went. And so he would ride this little tiny little tricycle, and we, we taught him that when he got to the stop sign, that he had to stop and turn around and come back. Because if he went around the turn, we couldn't see him. And there was a lot of traffic on the other side. So, so we had worked out this thing where he would ride his tricycle, and he would get down to the end, and I would say, stop sign, and he would say, stop sign, and he would turn around and come back. And so this was, you know, this regular, stop sign, stop sign, come back. Ah, oh, this is wonderful. Then one day, the fall. Um, <laughs> stop sign, and he went, stop sign. <laughs> like, what do you think is on the other side there? What is it, like like Toys R Us or something? What are you doing? You're like, no. And so I could run down there. Didn't we say, yeah? Didn't you, did, did you hear me? I heard you. Did, what, why did you do? I wanted to. I thought, there you go. That's sin. That's the best illustration of sin I've ever seen. And, and the horrible thing is I've seen it in me. You've probably seen it in you, right? It's not that we didn't know. We knew that was wrong. We clicked on that spot anyway and watched something that we shouldn't have watched. We knew that it was wrong to think this, but we entertained that thought. It's rebellion. It causes alienation and separation from God. So I want you to see the severity of the problem and the universality of the problem, and then I want you to see the wonderful, absolutely astounding substitutionary solution. God sends this servant to pay for our sins. Did you catch it when I read it, how Isaiah put this juxtaposition between he and us? He and us. It's this back and forth. Did you feel it? it was, um, here, uh, um, I don't mean this to make this a Hebrew lesson, but, but Hebrew is the kind of language where you could actually mention the specific pronoun, he or us or me, or you could just add it as a dot or as a letter at the end of a word. But if you wanted to emphasize the pronoun, you would make sure that you use that word. He's emphasized, he took up our infirmities. He carried our sorrows. 
We considered him stricken, smitten by him and afflicted. He was pierced for our transgression. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was upon him. I mean, it is, it's rather repetitious, isn't it? He paid for sin so that you don't have to. He received God's wrath so that you could receive God's grace. God did not pour out his wrath on you. He poured it out on him. Sin is so bad, it requires death. And he paid the death that you should have paid. Your sin is so bad that nothing short of the death of the Son of God could pay for it. And that's exactly what we have. Many people have tried to put this in, in poetic ways so that it would, it would, we would remember it and it would dig down into our soul. <coughs> one, one writer put it this way, um, our sin is so bad that God had to die for us. But his love was so great, he was glad to die for us. Uh, literature that comes out of Redeemer Presbyterian Church in New York City says... Um, the gospel tells us we're more wicked and sinful than we ever dare believe. But in Christ, we're more loved and accepted than we ever dared hope. Jerry Bridges, in a number of his books, um, uh, put it this way. I believe this is in from his book, Discipline of Grace. Your best days are never so good as to be beyond the need of God's grace. But your worst days are never so bad to be beyond the reach of God's grace. You've got to find ways to say this to yourself so that it brings you back to amazement and wonder. I deserve to be cut off. And instead, he was cut off for me. I deserve alienation forever. He received alienation so that I could go to be with him forever. Here, let me, I, I'm just, I'm trying to say it in a number of different ways so that it grabs you. Some of us have been Christians for long enough that it's no longer anything more than just, yeah, uh-huh, yep, I got a formula, I got to figure it out, got the words. And I think when we tell people, that's what they hear. Why, now, why would I want to believe this? You seem kind of bored by it. I remember one time sitting, um, uh, I was listening to a sermon uh, on, an, on a, a CD in my car, and I could tell that I was getting to the end of the sermon, um, um, but I, I didn't want to you know, go, and I had arrived at where I was supposed to go to, and I saw that I had about five minutes left, and I could wait, so I just sat outside in the car in the parking lot listening. It was Tim Keller, the uh, pastor at Redeemer Prez, and he was talking about um, that verse in the book of Hebrews where it says that uh, Jesus, for the joy set before him, endured the cross, despising the shame, and he, and he, and he zoomed in on that phrase, for the joy set before him, the joy set before him, and, um, and he just, what, what, what joy could there possibly be? He was about to go through the most excruciating physical pain, emotional pain, and spiritual pain. He was going to be atoning for the death of, of, of millions of people, uh, the sins of millions of people. He was going to experience alienation between the Father. What possible joy could there be in that? Um, and, and Keller kind of belabored it. You know, what, what was it that Jesus was going to get that he didn't already have? He already had total, complete fellowship with the Father. He had already been in heaven. He knew he was going back to it, but he already had it. So well, what was the joy set before him? What did he get that he didn't already have? And then he said, he gets us. He gets you. He gets me. That's the joy set before him. People who had rebelled and were now cut off are going to be brought back in. And I sat in my car and just cried. And I thought, when's the last time this brought me to tears? So we've got to find ways to, to sit 
and meditate on a passage like Isaiah 53, 4 through 6, and chew on words like stricken, smitten, pierced, crushed. Punishment that brought us peace was upon him. By his wounds we are healed. Okay, one last story. When I uh, came to that point in, on the high rise of Johnson Hall in, at Temple University and said, Jesus is the Messiah, I want to follow him, I want to get to know him, I mentioned to um, a friend of mine that I was a new Christian. And, um, and I said, I come from a Jewish background, and I'm, I'm, I'm a Jewish Christian. I was finding the words for the first time in my life. And he said, oh, I need to introduce you to my friend Mort Lowenstein. Yes, it's a Jewish name, yes. Um, and I, I, oh, okay, he has Bible studies in his night, in his house, every Friday night. You should come with me to his Bible study. Okay, so Mort Lowenstein, Mort and Jean Lowenstein had the Bible study every Friday night. They were studying the book of Romans from a Jewish perspective. They had this big bowl of iced tea and bagels. And I thought, does life get any better than this? Bagels and the Bible? you got to be kidding. And I like iced tea. This is great. And so we studied the book of Romans. And Mort would say things like, I never understood any part of the Bible until I came to know Jesus. Jesus opened up my eyes to both Old and New Testament so that they, they both make sense. He said, Jesus made me, Jesus made me kosher. <laughs> I'm more Jewish now that I believe in Jesus than I was before. And, and Mort was an older man than me, and it was just a delight every Friday night to hear Jewish eyes looking at the book of Romans and talk about Paul, the Jewish rabbi who had turned believer and how it all fit together, and how Romans was the fulfillment of Isaiah and all of those prophets. It was the, it was the, the best training ever. Years later, um, I had moved away from Philadelphia, and I was back in town for a concert, and uh, there was Mort Lowenstein. I hadn't seen him in a very long time, and I came up to him, and I shook his hand, and his hand felt really hard. I felt like I was, uh, was, was shaking hands with a mannequin. <laughs> And uh, his hand was really hardened because he had a disease called scleroderma. They made tremendous progress with uh, treatments for sclero scleroderma, but at the time, there wasn't really much they could do. It, that word means hardening of the skin, and the problem with scleroderma is it doesn't just stop with the skin. Eventually, it hardens everything and hardens the internal organs, and it's fatal. And it was not too much longer after that that Mort died. A very good friend of mine went to go see Mort the day before he died in the hospital. Mort was in excruciating pain, and yet uh, my friend Marshall walked into the hospital room, and there was Mort standing, dancing around his hospital bed. The Hora, a Jewish dance of praise and joy. It's what Jewish people dance at weddings. And my friend Marshall said, Mort, aren't you going to hurt yourself? He says, yeah, it hurts really terribly. It's really, it's really bad. What, what are you doing? He said, I'm preparing. Right. <laughs> the next day, Mort was not in pain anymore and probably dancing and singing about Yeshua HaMashiach. Do you know him? Does he delight you? Does his words stimulate you? May it be that our Lord would use this weekend toward that end. Amen? Yes. Amen. Let me pray for us. Our Father, thank you for the way you work in our lives. Some of us here in this room have known you for a long time. Some of us are very new to this. Some of us are still checking it out, perhaps. Would you work in our hearts and in our minds? Would you help this make sense to us? And would you help it be... Um, the, the satisfaction of the longing that we've been longing for, whether it is in music or beauty or a person or a job or success or money, whatever it is, Lord, would you show us that those things might be good gifts, but they're not good gods. And would you work this weekend so that we would delight in the wonderful news 
that you have been pierced for our transgressions. We pray all this in the name of Jesus.